According to the Officer Down Memorial page, a nonprofit organization dedicated to honoring fallen law enforcement officers, a total of eight cops have died in the line of duty so far this year. The most recent such case was that of Officer Cody Allen of the Independence Police Department in Independence, Missouri. Allen was one of the officers who responded to a report of a man who had been shot last week on February 29th. That man was court officer Drexel Mack. Mr. Mack had gone with two other court officials to remove a man from a home after a year-long eviction process. On February 23rd, Mack had gone to the property and served a notice to vacate. Less than a week later, he returned with the two other officials to effectuate the eviction. Mack and his colleagues popped the padlock off of the gate that opened onto the driveway. They went up to the house, knocked on the door, and announced themselves, but got no answer. The three court agents then drilled out the lock on the front door. Mack entered the home along with one of the other officials, at which time the evictee, who was at home in fact, opened fire on the court officers from within the dwelling. Drexel Mack was struck by gunfire and fell to the floor just inside of the front door. The other officials fled and reported the shooting. Independence police officer Cody Allen responded to the scene. He and two other cops entered the home to render aid to Mr. Mack and bring him out of the house. Again, shots rang out. All three cops were struck by gunfire. Additional police units arrived. In the ensuing confrontation with the shooter, Independence police shot, subdued, and arrested the evictee and suspect 68-year-old Larry Acree. Acree was taken to a local hospital where he received treatment for his injuries. The three police officers and one court agent who were shot were also transported to receive medical care. Two of the police officers survived their gunshot wounds, but Officer Cody Allen and process server Drexel Mack were both pronounced dead. Officer Allen was 35 years old. Drexel Mack was 41. Mr. Larry Acree has been charged with two counts of first-degree murder and other crimes and is being held on $2 million bail. A little over a week before this incident, in Burnsville, Minnesota, two cops and a firefighter were shot to death while responding to a home where there was a reported hostage situation. The incident ended when the suspect took his own life. These tragedies notwithstanding, Killings of law enforcement officers across the United States are not as common as they had been previously. The number of American cops who died violently fell to 51 in 2003 from 61 the previous year. 73 officers were killed on the job the year before that, 2001. Also, these numbers are far lower than the stats from 50 or so years ago when upwards of 100 cops would be slain in the line of duty in a typical year. In every state, to kill a police officer is among the highest crimes one can commit, and correspondingly, these offenses summon the harshest penalties, including the death sentence in 27 states, where that punishment has not been banned. Following are three stories of law enforcement officers who died violently in the line of duty and of the individuals who took their lives in recent years. It's June 16th, 2021, in the city of Holly Springs, Georgia. Holly Springs is a town of about 17,000 people in Cherokee County, about 30 miles north of Atlanta. The man behind the wheel of this gray Nissan Altima is 29-year-old Ansi Dolce. This is a simple traffic stop. Holly Springs Police Sergeant Andrew Drake just caught Dolce doing 72 miles per hour in a 40 mile per hour zone. Sergeant Drake had no way of knowing that Dolce was a fugitive who was then being sought by federal authorities. About 20 months before this stop, in the fall of 2019, Dolce was almost a thousand miles away in the state of New York, where he removed the GPS monitor with which the New York Department of Corrections had fitted him. He'd been released on parole after convictions for robbery and attempted robbery. Free of the tracking device, he fled the state. U.S. Marshals tracked him from New York to Illinois and Missouri into Georgia. He apparently had roots in Georgia. Cherokee County Sheriff's Office records show the deputies were called to a home near the town of Woodstock, Georgia, on two different occasions back in 2016 and 2017, based on allegations that Dolce had gotten into fights with his siblings. 
Court records say that Dolce was a confirmed member of the Sex Money Murder Gang, a Georgia subset of the larger Bloods Gang. He had competed in mixed martial arts, and his criminal record also included an open domestic violence case involving his wife in Illinois. After shedding the GPS device in New York and eluding the authorities for nearly two years, he was back in Georgia in June of 2021. Around the time of this traffic stop, feds had been surveilling Dolce's mother's home in the nearby town of Waleska, Georgia, hoping to apprehend him there. This footage was recorded just before midnight on June 16th and shows Dolce pulling to a stop on Hickory Road near Harmony Lake Drive as Sergeant Drake's headlights flashed in his rear view. Officer Joe Burson arrived on the scene to assist Sergeant Drake. As Sergeant Drake exchanged words with Dolce, he noticed a strong odor of what he believed to be marijuana coming from the motorist's car and asked him to step out of the vehicle. Here, while Sergeant Drake dips inside his cruiser to run Dolce's information, Officer Burson stands near the detained man and questions him. What's in your pockets? 2317, 7154. Let me see what's in your hand there. Put it back in the Go ahead. Can I just call my mom? Sorry, can I call my mom, please? Uh, not right now. You're being honest with us. She'll get you out of here shortly. After we're done, then. Cherokee, there's seven, six, eight, Not at the moment, no. Why do you need a lawyer if what you're telling us is true? Because you guys are about to arrest me. Why? 23 I know the drill. Sorry? I know the drill. You said you smell pot, so we're going to search the car. So you're going to arrest me and detain me. Is there pot in there? How much? Sure. No, no, no. Just, no. Stop. Stop. Oh, oh, Go oh, back. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was going to the car. Burson and Drake both zap Dolce with their tasers. Dolce manages to withstand the electric shocks, enough to throw his vehicle into drive. Soon he pulls off with Officer Burson still hanging on to the car. Dolce drives approximately 1,000 feet down the road with Officer Burson in tow before hitting a guardrail and crashing into this ditch to the left. During those few seconds, Officer Burson managed to fire multiple shots, wounding Dolce as he drove along. Officer Burson was dragged by Dolce's vehicle and suffered severe injuries. He died at the scene. Sergeant Drake followed Dolce's car. Here the sergeant can be seen ordering Dolce out of the ditch as other units responded to the distress call from Drake. Here, Dolce appears to be bleeding from the abdomen as he's taken into custody. Ansi Dolce died at a local hospital later from the gunshot wound he sustained. Officer Burson was only 24 years old at the time of his killing. He had been with the Holly Springs Police Department for less than two years. He was praised in the local media as a model cop. In 2022, the story went viral when body and dash cam footage was released to the public along with the findings of an inquiry into the incident by the Georgia Bureau of Investigations. The agency found that Burson was justified in firing the shots that killed Ansi Dolce. No, no, 
no, no, no, no, no, no, no. No. What happened? I don't know. The cop was just talking to Bobby, and then we heard a bunch of gunshots. We're afraid to go back there. I think they're dead. On March 30th of 2009, in Flagstaff, Arizona, which is a city of about 75,000 people, roughly 150 miles north of Phoenix, police responded to an apartment inhabited by a man named Robert Bobby Smith and his then-girlfriend. Bobby's mother had reported that the young man, who was about 22 years old at the time, had threatened to take his own life. He'd been suicidal since he was in high school, according to his mother. Police spoke to Mr. Smith and to his girlfriend. The two were in the process of a breakup and Bobby had told his girlfriend that if she left him, he would shoot himself. The pair had had an explosive argument after another man called the young woman's phone. The woman informed the police that she wasn't physically injured. However, since Bobby had taken her phone from her, broke it, and also had taken her car keys in order to prevent her from leaving, he was arrested for domestic violence, disorderly conduct, and criminal damage. According to the arrest report, Mr. Smith told officers that he was deeply depressed over the breakup and that he had just been fired from his job. As he was being taken into custody, the despondent young man tried to run to his girlfriend to hug her goodbye while shouting to her that he loved her. Officers tackled him before he could reach her. Bobby spent the night in jail. Due to the domestic violence charge and concerns over Bobby's mental state, the cops confiscated guns that Bobby had in the apartment, including a pair of shotguns which had been illegally modified. The charges against him were eventually dropped and his criminal record was clean for the next several years until the winter of 2014. As Christmas of that year came and went, Mr. Bobby Smith, 28 years old by this time, was now involved with a different woman and things were not going well between the pair. On December 27th, Mr. Smith's girlfriend called the cops and reported a domestic disturbance. Officer Tyler Stewart was dispatched to the residence to investigate. Mr. Smith's girlfriend explained to Officer Stewart that she was not injured and had not been assaulted, but Bobby had damaged property in her apartment. She said that Bobby went crazy and was yelling for a long time. She said that he tore down curtain rods in her apartment, damaged the refrigerator, knocked things over, and spilled nail polish in her bedroom. The argument began, apparently, over unwashed dishes. Before the fight, Smith had just returned from his hometown of Prescott, Arizona, where he spent Christmas with his family. It's been reported that at the time, he hadn't slept in four days because of persistent agony from an infected tooth. One of Bobby's friends has said that the troubled man's teeth were falling out. Furthermore, he didn't have health insurance and he'd been informed that the dental work that he needed would cost $20,000, which he didn't have. Bobby didn't know what to do about the predicament. After the fight with his girlfriend, Bobby Smith visited a friend to commiserate. Then he got word that the cops were looking for him. At a little after noon, he called 911. My roommate told me that there's a police officer at my address looking for me. I'm wondering what that's about, he said to the dispatcher. He left a message and the dispatcher told Mr. Smith that Officer Stewart would contact him back. Records show text conversations Mr. Smith had with another friend that afternoon. Bobby told his buddy that his girlfriend had called the police on him, quote, for breaking his own stuff. I couldn't think, Bobby texted to the friend. My tooth is killing me. His friend tried to reason with him. You shouldn't be breaking stuff, Bob. It's not reasonable adult behavior. She was probably scared. Bobby kept talking about his toothache. Mr. Smith told his friend that his girlfriend had started the fight. My tooth hurt so bad I lost control, Smith said. Bobby's friend tried to talk him into going back to the home of their other friend. I'm too scared to go anywhere, Bobby said. I need help. His friend made one last plea for him to go talk it out at their other friend's home, but his message was never answered. Before long, Bobby Smith had connected with Officer Stewart. The two arranged to meet at Bobby's residence. Officer Stewart showed up at a little after 1 p.m. A roommate answered the door, then called for Bobby to come out. Then Mr. Bobby Smith and Officer Stewart went outside into the frigid winter air to have a talk. Alright. Don't have any weapons in your pockets or anything like that? No, sir, I'm just cold. 
Okay. My tooth does not let me eat in days. So. Okay. How bad is the pain? On a scale of 1 to 10, like a 12. Like a 12? It shoots up to here and here. Okay. So, I was in the area. Uh -huh. Got some other calls coming in, but I thought I'd swing by. Here. Officer Stewart questions Bobby about property damage for which he might be responsible at his girlfriend's house. Um, the other stuff in the apartment, she's showing me like a little bookshelf. Um, the polish, he didn't stay out of the polish got that way. She said the pumpkin got knocked over or the handle got ripped off or whatever, the stem. Oh, the pumpkin. <laughs> yeah. No, honestly. So the dog was around when this all happened? Yeah, freaking out. The two men talk for a little less than three minutes. Then Officer Stewart asks Mr. Smith about the contents of his pockets and appears ready to frisk him. Which, you know, no, okay. Really you mind if I just pat down your pockets real quick? You don't have anything in here? No, no. Okay. There's nothing in here? No, this is my smoke. Okay. Bobby Smith pulled out a 22 caliber pistol from his pocket and shot Officer Stewart in the face, then continued firing at the fallen cop as he lay defenseless. Moments later, Mr. Smith took possession of Officer Stewart's service weapon and used it to shoot himself dead. Inside the home, Smith's roommates ducked for cover as the gunshots rang out and as one bullet pierced the kitchen window. When it sounded like the shooting was over, one of the roommates stood up and looked outside. He saw Bobby walk past and take off his hat. Then the roommate heard one more shot in the side yard. One of the roommates called 911. No, 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 no. No. What happened? The cop was just talking to Bobby, and then we heard a bunch of gunshots. We're afraid to go back there. I think they're dead. Bobby Smith died at the scene. First responders found Officer Stewart in critical condition. They also found Stewart's service weapon on the ground and a 40 caliber casing from the pistol near Smith's body. Mr. Smith had fired all six shots from his revolver. Officer Stewart suffered five gunshot wounds, including four to the head and one in the lower back. The sixth bullet missed the officer, ricocheted, and zoomed through the kitchen window of Bobby's home. His roommates were not injured. Smith opened fire, shooting multiple times and hitting Officer Stewart in the face. Backup tried to save him, did CPR, and he was rushed to a Flagstaff hospital where he died. The victim here, again, Officer Tyler Jacob Stewart, just 24 years old, had only been on the Flagstaff Police Department for a year. Friends of Bobby Smith believe that the combination of the excruciating pain he was in due to his tooth infection, him having gone days without sleep, the problems he was having with his girlfriend, and his fear of going to jail, along with various other personal trials he was experiencing, all drove Bobby to the decision to commit suicide. He had told at least one friend that he had contemplated ending it all. When Officer Stewart went to frisk him, Bobby apparently feared that the cop would find his gun and foil his plan to take his own life. I just want to be clear. Do we have officers involved in a shooting? We have three officers that have been shot. All units respond. Hold your traffic. Shots have been fired. On Saturday night, she and two other officers were responding to a domestic violence call at this home. Ronald and Crystal Hamilton both grew up in South Carolina and began dating as teenagers. He was three years older than she was. After high school, Ronnie, as he was called by family, enlisted in the Army shortly after the 9-11 terror attacks. He headed off for his first tour of duty in the war-torn country of Iraq in 2003. The following year, 18-year-old Crystal's family was surprised to find out that she was pregnant. Her mother and sister had no idea that her and Ronnie's relationship was as serious as it was. In February of 2005, Ronnie and Crystal's son was born. They named him Tyreek. In the spring of that year, the couple married at a courthouse. Before the year was over, Ronald went to Iraq for his second deployment. He returned in September of 2006 and continued his military career. By the year 2011, the couple moved with their son to the northern Virginia city of Woodbridge and Ronnie started working at the Pentagon in nearby Arlington. Then Crystal got hired in 2012 
as a recovery care coordinator for wounded and ill Marines at Walter Reed Medical Center. At some point, the couple's relationship began to sour. Crystal's job required her to work closely with soldiers as they mended from their injuries. Ronald apparently became jealous of her work interactions as she was surrounded by men every day. He suspected her of being unfaithful. One day, Ronnie assaulted a man he believed was having an affair with his wife. He never faced charges in that incident, but the pair's problems persisted. Ironically, Ronald was, in fact, cheating on Crystal. He admitted as much to her on the morning of Christmas 2015. Subsequently, Crystal came to the decision to dissolve the marriage and seek full custody of Tyreek. She was planning on going forward with the divorce sometime in spring of the next year, 2016, when Ronnie would be moving to Italy to work for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO. Ronnie and Crystal were sleeping in separate bedrooms, and they argued regularly. On an afternoon in February of 2016, the couple was home alone, and they were at it again. Crystal had informed Ronnie that she would be going out with friends that night to attend a show that featured male exotic dancers. Ronnie flipped the fuck out and told her that she couldn't go. An argument commenced and escalated. 11-year-old Tyreek came home from a sleepover that afternoon and heard his parents arguing. The boy heard his mother tell his father that he had no respect for her. He heard his father tell his mother that if she went out, she couldn't come back. At some point, his parents were both in the guest bedroom where his mother would sleep. The boy was in his own bedroom. Then the boy heard a loud crash. This apparently was the sound of his mother being thrown against the wall and the television toppling to the floor. At some point, Tariq heard his father warning his mother not to call 911, but the woman was able to make the emergency call. Crystal informed the dispatcher that she had been assaulted. She said that her husband had just thrown her against the wall. Then the woman seems to complain that her head was hurting as a result of the assault. What's your name? The dispatcher asked. Crystal said her full name. Then the dispatcher heard the anguished woman scream the word stop before the call was disconnected. Ronnie came out of Crystal's bedroom and told Tyreek that his mother was fine. Then the man went back into the bedroom and closed the door. Soon the boy heard three or so gunshots, after which his mother fell silent. Prince William County Police Officer Jesse Hempen was dispatched to the Hamilton residence. He arrived approximately eight minutes after Crystal's 911 call was placed. Ronnie came outside and told the officer that his wife wasn't home. The officer asked to be let inside. Ronnie refused. The officer insisted. Two other officers arrived on the scene, Ashley Gwendon and David McCown. Soon Ronnie retreated into the residence. Officer Jesse Hempen tried to push his way inside before Ronnie could close the door. However, the cop was overpowered by the six foot two inch, 260 pound man who shut the door and locked the officers out. The cops decided that they would force entry into the home, concerned for the welfare of the female resident. Officer McCown kicked in the door. When the door swung open, McCown found himself staring down the barrel of an AK-47 semi-automatic rifle as Ronnie sat crouched in the foyer of the home, aiming the high-powered weapon directly at him. Ronnie opened fire. Officer McCown saw muzzle flashes from the rifle as he felt the bullets impacting his body. All three officers were struck by gunfire. Officer McCown stumbled off the porch and fell flat on his face on the front lawn. He could hear the blood pumping out of his arm. He got on his radio to alert fellow officers that shots had been fired and that the shooter had a rifle which could cut through any protective ballistic vests cops would be wearing. And he gave the code Signal 1, which means an officer in imminent danger. Officer Jesse Hempen was able to take cover, but he was severely injured. There was a baseball-sized hole in the upper part of his leg. He could see Officer Gwendon's face as she lay prone on the front lawn with her eyes open. Pretty soon, Prince William County Police swarmed the block where the Hamilton home was located. Eventually, they were able to convince Mr. Hamilton to come out of the home. He surrendered and was taken into custody. Soon after he was handcuffed, Ronnie said to Police Sergeant Joey Medawar, who was on the scene, quote, 
I ruined my life. Take your gun out and shoot me now. Unquote. The police sergeant declined to draw his weapon and shoot Ronnie. However, at least one responding officer admitted publicly later that he had in fact considered taking a shot at Mr. Hamilton before the man was placed under arrest. Ronnie waived his Miranda rights and had a conversation with Sergeant Medawar. Ronnie Hamilton admitted to the shootings. He said that an argument precipitated the initial shooting of his wife, then he opened fire on the police as they stormed his home. Ronnie told the cop that he believed he was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of his service overseas, though he admitted that he'd never been diagnosed with the condition. Young Tyreek was not harmed in the incident. His mother suffered a total of four gunshot wounds to her head and torso and died at the scene. She was 29 years old. Officers Hempen, Gwendon, and McCown were all rushed to the hospital. Hempen and McCown were saved. Officer Ashley Gwendon died from her injuries. She was 28 years of age. She was working her first shift as an officer when she was killed and had just been sworn in the previous day. Sergeant Ronald Hamilton was charged with multiple felonies, including the first degree murder of his wife, capital murder of a police officer, and two counts of attempted capital murder of a police officer. Prosecutors would seek the death penalty. About 30 months later, in September of 2018, Mr. Hamilton went on trial for the killings of which he'd been accused. The prosecution said that Hamilton's actions in February of 2016 had a disastrous effect on multiple families and on the community as well. By the time he was done unleashing his violence, prosecutor Brian Boyle said during his opening statement, a neighborhood was scarred, a police department was devastated, three police officers were on operating tables, and only two would survive, and a son was left without a mother. During the course of the trial, the prosecution unfolded its narrative of the events that occurred on the fateful day and said that Mr. Hamilton's actions were premeditated, which would have to be proven in order to put the man to death. The defense sought only to save Mr. Hamilton from execution. The defense acknowledged that Hamilton perpetrated the killings and wounded the other two officers, but said that his actions were not calculated and were committed in the heat of passion. It said that Hamilton fired indiscriminately at the officers as they tried to enter his home and that he had no intention of killing them. Lawyers for the defense explained that Ronnie and Crystal's marriage had long been troubled and that an explosive argument began on the fateful day after Mrs. Hamilton announced her plans to patronize male strippers with her girlfriends. According to the defense, Ronald knew that his military career and his marriage could be over after his wife reported the assault, and the man simply lost control. He felt his world was crashing down around him, one of Ronald's public defenders said. Passions erupted. The defense argued that Mr. Hamilton should be convicted on lesser charges of either second-degree murder or voluntary manslaughter, and that he should not be sentenced to death. The prosecution countered that Mr. Hamilton's intent was clear given the fact that after choosing to kill his wife with a Glock handgun, he then upgraded to a more powerful AK-47 rifle in preparation for the anticipated police response. He shot his wife in the face, shot her again as she was going down to the floor, then shot her again in the brainstem, said one district attorney. Then, the DA said, the defendant made a premeditated decision to switch to his semi-automatic rifle rather than his Glock pistol because he knew that rounds from the smaller weapon would not penetrate the arriving policemen's vests. The DA said that Mr. Hamilton richly deserves the ultimate punishment. On Wednesday, September 26th of 2018, after less than eight hours of deliberation, the jury found Ronald Hamilton guilty on all counts, including capital murder. Five months later, in March of the following year, the jury convened to decide if Mr. Hamilton would be sentenced to life or death. Over the course of three days, the jury deliberated for 12 hours and ultimately was deadlocked, split, six votes for death and six votes against, meaning that Mr. Hamilton would not be put to death. On March 7th of 2019, 35-year-old Ronald Hamilton was sentenced to serve seven consecutive life terms. He's now being housed at Virginia's notorious Supermax Red Onion State Prison. He will never be eligible for parole. 
Peace, you guys. Once again, thanks to all of you guys for tuning in. Thanks for liking. Thanks for commenting. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for helping me to grow this channel. Those of you who haven't hit those magic like and subscribe buttons as of yet, please go ahead and do so. That's a way that you can quickly and easily help this channel to grow. And all of you who have been following the channel for a while, I really appreciate you continuing to give me a bit of your time and attention. I couldn't do this without you. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.